If you follow the older model, which is to create a massively precious piece of art that you're not going to put out for very long, that only really works for like the artists that are so top of mind that people are going to be sitting around ravenously waiting for four or five years before the person puts out their next album. That is not the scenario that most people are facing. If you don't put out something, you know, in a year, they've completely forgotten about you. And I feel like that attention span is even shorter than that. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by Sonarworks, helping you get the most out of your mixes by correcting the sound of the speakers and headphones in your studio so you get your mix right the first time. Are you sick of doing multiple mixes and still you can't get the low end right? How would it feel to have badass bass the first time? Get a 21 day free trial at sonarworks.com. Are you ready to rock the perfect mix? This episode is sponsored by OWC, Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and use Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Jonathan Heidel. Trained in both piano performance and composition with a minor in painting, Jonathan likes to bring a wide range of artistic influences to his music. After getting a master's in education as well, he founded the Forte Music School, where 180 plus students receive private lessons with focus on recording, arranging pieces they learn. He then focused on composing for film and TV and has most recently started to write and release work as a solo artist as well. His solo work sounds like a self-described blend of James Blake, Radiohead, and Philip Glass with a pinch of Kanye. Nice description, dude. I like that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, I've known Jonathan for quite some time and have also been aware that he loves using Ableton Live and the push controller. But recently, I saw some of his live performance videos on YouTube and thought it would be awesome to have Jonathan on the show to talk about using the push controller and live as both a composition tool and performance DAW. Jonathan says he has also been drawing some of his inspiration for composition from watching TV lately, particularly Project Runway. So he's going to tell us how he is drawing inspiration from the fashion industry in creating music and why Ableton Live is such a great platform for that. And also talk about composing for film and TV. Please welcome Jonathan Heidel to Recording Studio Rockstars. Jonathan, are you ready to rock, dude? Yes. Thanks for having me here. You're welcome, man. I'm it's glad to have you hanging out on the podcast in full transparency Rockstars, Jonathan was a neighbor of mine here in East Nashville years ago and now lives in Portland, Oregon. That's where you are, right? Portland? Yes, Portland. Yeah, that's what I thought. Not Portland, Maine. Not Portland, Maine. That's a place I like to go in the summers. Um, (laughs) But uh, yeah, uh, you've always been really interested in in music that is very expressive, I would say. And um, I I don't know how you like to describe it. but I think of you less less focused on sort of pop songs and more focused on um, songs that are kind of have an artistic quality to them, or maybe create wonderful moods that that go really well in film and and TV compositions. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think I definitely draw heavily on my uh, classical background. Um, when I was doing undergraduate, is I was bouncing back and forth between uh, piano performance and composition. So studying music theory and looking at 
sonatas and symphonies and the forms that they use, those uh, early times definitely shaped the way that I approach music now, uh, where composers would use a melody line and they would uh, develop that and come up with variations on it. That's a very Beethoven thing to do. Mm -hmm. And that kind of look at how do you take melodic or harmonic elements and change them. You're constantly working with them. Uh, one of the big things in classical music, either from performing or from composing, is you never repeat anything the same way you did before. Even if there's a repeat sign, you're still going to do something different. Maybe play a little quieter, maybe a little bit faster or something. And so that constant um, making sure there's always a, a nuance of change that's happening I think was embedded into me at a very early age with regard to my music training. So what's interesting to me to hear you talk about that is, you know, the the idea of a repeated theme through music is the first thing that I remember learning about um, film composition. You know, in, in a Star Wars film, for example, you'll have different themes that are just repeated and same thing. They might be treated different ways. And I guess that really makes sense that the first... Um, you know, classical uh, compositions are in a lot of ways like movies without an image on the screen. And classical music was probably one of the first styles of music that was um, paired up with film to make it more expressive. Do, what are, are there any other connections between classical and film that, that you want to hip us to? Well, I, I would also say that the people that were writing music for film, you know, decades ago, definitely had classical training. You know, they were writing for orchestra and for multiple instruments. There was no, uh, you know, fancy DAW that you could use to replicate anything. So if you were going to write for film, you had to write basically for orchestra and had to understand that. So there was definitely uh, a really strong training from a classical standpoint for early film composers. I would even put it more on that side of it necessarily than classical music was used in that. Mm -hmm. It's just that if you were going to do film, uh, it would be primarily orchestral instruments that were going to be playing the music for that. Yeah, you literally have to have somebody who could write out all the music, which was probably somebody who was classically trained as well. Yeah, or to know the instrumentation or to draw from orchestral uh, sources or of inspiration. I mean, one of the biggest things that people have criticized John Williams about <clears throat> is that he borrowed so heavily from other classical composers. And some people felt like he, he really lifted a lot, almost to a degree of plagiarism, but you know, he's obviously very skilled on his own right. And, um, but definitely all those early uh, film composers were definitely classically trained. You know, first thought that comes into my head, too, is how often very successful music borrows heavily from something, you know, hit songs, pop music. Um, I think there's a lot of examples of music in its history where it uh, something that has done very well has indeed borrowed heavily from the past. Uh, but we don't have to get too deep into music history here. Uh, tell us more about starting out in recording and how would you get into all this stuff? Well, starting into recording is was a much rougher start for me. Uh, I did start doing some basic recording in the 90s, and I use recording very loosely because at that time, I was using a computer. I used Cakewalk <laughs> on a computer that was like a 386K processor uh, on a monochrome monitor, but it wasn't really recording. It was sequencing back then. I was mm -hmm. using a MIDI keyboard and sequencing things. So I didn't really get into recording, actually recording audio onto a computer until like, I think about 2010 or 2011. And it was a really, before that time, I'd really only done sequencing. Uh, so recording, I found was an entirely different process, and it was uh, really painful because <laughs> <laughs> not, not a cakewalk at all. 
What, were not you, a cakewalk. If you were sequencing things, were you primarily putting things together for live performance, or were you putting them together to go into somebody else's studio who would record it for you once you had you could present your whole sequence composition? Well, you know, I I don't remember a lot of that <laughs> the recording process, but I my first uh, I do remember my first film score that I did, which was in college, and I sequenced all of it and had it all laid out and went through the process of after when I was ready to record, I just plugged it into, you know, the recording device, which I believe was a tape recorder uh, at the college and then just played the sequence and then recorded what came out of my keyboard because I had no understanding of EQ or anything else like that. They took this, uh, whatever I recorded, put it with the film, and then it played for the whole school. And I was mortified because the bass, the low end was like absurdly loud and it was all <laughs> muffled and it it just sounded terrible. And I, I, you know, listening to it come out the keyboard, you're hearing with no loss of audio fidelity. You know, you're hearing it straight from your headphones and I had a multi-timbral keyboard that could play multiple MIDI channels and sounds mm -hmm. at the same time. So I just listened to it straight out of the keyboard and had no real understanding that of how to preserve that auto audio quality into any sort of recording. So that was that was pretty brutal to hear that the first time. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, failures like that are some of the best teachers too. What were some of the do you remember sort of that having a, a positive quality because it caused you to start making better versions of your your music after that experience. Um, not yet. It took a, <laughs> not right <laughs> away. No, because I, I I couldn't figure out how to make it sound any better. And I would write something, and I would I could tell that it was a good song or a good composition. Uh, but then when I would listen to the recording of it, it just sounded terrible yeah. and I couldn't figure out how to make it sound better. I didn't know how to use a compressor or adjust levels or EQ and the horridness of that actually caused me to stop for a while because, or give up because I just didn't know how to make it sound better. And it wasn't until I started to, uh, actually the thing that turned me around was a, quote by Ira Glass that I think more people are now familiar with, where he discussed his recording history and how that when you have good taste, the essence of the quote is that if you have good taste, you're basically going to hate everything you do for a while because yeah. it's going to suck and you're going to know it sucks. And that spoke to me because that's exactly how I felt about listening to my recordings is that they totally sucked and it was excruciating to listen to them and not know what to do to fix them. But yeah, that's a, that's know. a, that is a good quote. And I, um, I, I would think that's a good inspirational quote for you for this show too. But, um, the, uh, the essence of it is, you know, if that, that first you advance your, your musical taste and then you begin to create it yourself and, you know, what you create won't be as good as where your taste is at. But uh, but eventually you'll have a body of work, and and looking back on it, you know, your your the quality of what you will create will in, improve as you create a body of work until perhaps one day, you know, your musical taste and your what you're creating match. But I also think as an artist that it's that it's the fact that our musical our taste is advanced more advanced than what we can do that actually drives us. It's like the the horse in front of the cart that keeps pulling us forward to keep trying again and, and keep doing it. Maybe when you hear your uh, track up on a giant movie screen and it really sucks compared to where you thought it was, that could maybe, um, you know, break the wheels off your cart there for a minute. But um, I don't know, you know, I, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like, like what would happen if, if our ability to create something was as good as where our taste was? Do you think we'd probably just give up after a while or do you think we'd keep going? Well, that's a good question. I think it might impact everybody different. I can get stubborn and with 
I think what you're talking about is maybe a certain stubbornness to be good and or want to be good. Mm-hmm. And that creates a drive. And I think that I have that as well. When it hit me in the beginning, it felt so bad and the process was rough enough that that was more discouraging to me. I think it took me sitting with that for a while and then again, stumbling across the quote by Ira Glass that made me realize that I wasn't alone in that process. And I think that's the difference is initially I felt alone. I felt like, my God, this sucks. And I must be the only person who feels this way uh, because if you listen to this other stuff, it sounds great. So clearly there must be something wrong with me. And it wasn't until I kind of realized that I wasn't alone in that process that it gave me some sense of, and also some hope that like if I did work at it, it would get better. So I think I would say I had a a reaction on both sides of the coin to that experience. One was getting really discouraged, but then once I just had a little bit of hope, then my kind of stubborn determination came in that turned into a drive. But I, don't, I would drive without any hope, I think, is really difficult. Yeah. Well, um, rock stars, I hope that this podcast can be some of the hope and some of the community for you to feel a whole lot better and, and a whole lot safer about stumbling through those initial versions of creating stuff when you listen back and it's just not nowhere near close to what you thought it was going to be. I think a lot of the times we hear in our heads, it's the same thing. Like we have this vision for what we want to create in our head. When it doesn't come out right, it can be really discouraging. I find for me, one of the things that helps is to try and work quickly so that I can never let the critic catch enough breath inside my head to start beating me up for what I'm doing. Because it's a lot easier to look back on what I just finished yesterday, you know, the next day. And then go like, oh, that didn't, that wasn't all that great. Or maybe I'll look back on it and go, oh, that was much better than I thought. But um, tell us about some of the composers that really influenced you. And, and you know, did you feel like you were aware of anybody who was composing music using synthesizers and keyboards that did translate really well into recording? That's a great question. And for a number of years, I think that I... I struggled with trying to find my own voice and it was something that I really wanted to get to, which was to have some a sound that was unique. And I think a lot of times I would do what is very common where you notice some, something that someone's doing, you try to borrow or steal from them, so to speak, to, to try on their particular voice. And I think that's definitely a really strong approach. Mm-hmm. Um, it worked for John Williams, right? It certainly did. Yeah. And I'll go back to what you said before about uh, you brought up about Project Runway. Ironically, that watching that show had a greater impact on how I found my voice than sort of borrowing from any of the musical sides of things. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so, so yeah. So talk more about that and um, talk about, you know, I mean, I don't want to, presume to know where you're going with this, but talk about the, you know, the importance of being able to draw in inspiration to create music, um, whether it's artistic or technical from totally unexpected places. Yeah. Well, without going too much into the element of describing the show, maybe if someone hasn't really seen it, I'll give a brief synopsis. You know, they bring like 16 or 20 people together. It's a competition and they make them, they present a number of different fashion challenges to them. Make something for an evening wear, make a swimsuit, go to the dollar store and make things out of unconventional materials. And I, what I think is particularly what was interesting to me is that when the designers came on the show, they oftentimes had sort of their own idea of a niche that they had in mind. They, someone was a sportswear designer or they did evening wear. And I think that to me feels very similar to maybe how certain musicians are like, I do electronica or I do singer songwriter stuff. And that show forced these people out of their particular sense of comfort zone because they would have to create all these different types of outfits. Some of it is just for production excitement. Um, but 
what I noticed is that they kept asking or they kept identifying certain people as having a really clear artistic voice. And you could see it. Someone who was the people that were most successful, you could tell it was their outfit, even though it was a piece of swimwear or if it was a um, evening gown or if it was something made out of a bunch of straws, like somehow who they were came through all those elements. And instead of it being like they're just about evening wear or they make sportswear. And what I noticed is that the reason or the why their voice was so clear is they were often tapping into an artistic element that was at a more fundamental level than evening wear, such as color or pattern. And if they were into the nuance of how to combine different patterns, let's say, that would translate into these different elements. And in, when I, after a number of years watching this, suddenly it sunk in at this one point, and I realized, what was my artistic voice as a musician? Mm -hmm. Could I possibly write music for 10 guitars or for synthesizers or for an orchestra or for a choir? And would someone be able to hear that and know that's Jonathan Hadle? Like, it, it is immediately noticeable. Because I couldn't just tap into like, oh, I like to use analog synth or, or I like to um, do strum, lots of like finger picking on a guitar. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are some more surface level things that would be akin to someone being like, I'm an evening wear designer or I only make sportswear. And it, it caused me to look deeper and look at maybe some fundamental elements about music like repetition or tempo or harmony or melody these elements that uh, what what am I really going to what fascinates me and and not necessarily what am I going to like use a, as a shtick, but like what fascinates me and for me I start as I thought about that I really love these ostinato like melodic or rhythmical patterns and harmony like unique weird chords and harmonic patterns uh, are very come from my classical background I suppose but are some elements that I really fascinate me. And once I started to hold on to that, that well, more than anything started to influence how I started to compose and think about music. Because then I could pull from other things. Like I could look mm -hmm. at people who tended to do electronic work. Uh, someone like Philip Glass, I mean, is a good example. You can kind of imagine if he would compose for anything, you could hear it and start yeah. to recognize like, oh, I get it. He's about... A certain amount of minimalism and certainly repetition. Yeah, is, definitely a rhythmic it, it pattern. His main thing. And I started to see that as being the most important element in developing a voice. Then, of course, on top of that, you have another layer of like maybe within your particular genre. If you're into, you know, acoustic guitars and singer songwriter stuff, you could you could kind of go into some particular nuance of that. But that to me is a secondary element than the like the more fundamental element of like what are the musical elements that are most interesting to you, uh, I think is what changed my musical voice so, more than anything. So 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 how do you think that we can discover what our voice is or discover what our interests are as musical interests? What was some of the process for you of coming to terms with the things that you liked and being, it's almost like saying, what's your favorite color? And then you're like, well, I don't know. I like all the colors. Um, what, what's a way that you found it helpful to start to recognize the elements that you like in music? Yeah, that's a great question. I think then, so once I started to look at and recognize that it, it was the elements that were more important in developing a unique voice, then I started to notice those elements in other musicians. And for example, like Philip Glass, as you may, I mean, he's one of my influences and I do like a lot of repetition in my music. Mm -hmm. And I could look at his work and say, it's, it's the repetition piece that I find fascinating and then kind of extract that and be able to insert that into what I do uh, as a fundamental level. Or I would say, um, uh, you know, James Blake, for example, is another one of my influences. What I really like is the degree of, of space that he puts in there and maybe a certain degree of like his tempos are, are typically a little slower. He doesn't make really like 
upbeat music and I I like the way that he plays with tempo. And so then I can kind of extract that out of there. And so I think if you come down to a fundamental level and you really look at these elements of harmony and rhythm and um, timbre or, or tone, and uh, you you once you have those, you can look and notice what draws you and other musicians and their music and then be able to boil it down and extract it because it's a little bit, it's a removable element. Like, you know, repetition is, it's pretty broad. So you can like that in Philip Glass, but I don't have to be like Philip Glass to extract the element of repetition mm -hmm. and use that for myself. So it's like you, you begin by looking outside of your own work and just observing what you're seeing in some of your favorite artists and, and start to see where their voices are. Um, and then it, that helps you discover some of the elements of your own voice that you dig. Yeah. I think maybe, or where do you, where is your interest rise? Like I said, it's, I think curiosity is better than being just something that you like and you're extracting, but like what continues to catch your attention. Yeah. And so when I listen to other artists, I'm like, Oh, that's, I love that music, you know, maybe boiling it down to a little bit more specific, like what is it that actually catches my attention the most in what they're doing? Is it the way that they use, they work with melody or maybe it's the way that they layer sounds together. Um, and maybe it's the way that they play with tempo or, um, you know, in a recording standpoint, it could be the same sorts of elements as uh, that it could be listened to. And then I recognize if I notice that, in all these different artists that I keep being attracted to the same elements, the way that they're playing with pattern. You know, Suf John Stevens is another person that that plays heavily with like kind of rhythmical patterns that are being repeated. I like that in his work. I like that in Philip Glass and I like that in other particular artists. And if, and if I know Radiohead does that a lot. Um, and then if I start to notice what I like, maybe that's, that's something I used can work with and which is different than I like the color blue. But if you notice that you, you really like unusual combinations of colors, then maybe that's an element to work with in the voice, in your own particular voice that might give you more flexibility. Um, I have a friend who I think he has a really strong voice, but he tends to use a lot of reverb and sort of this idea of like a very lush sound. Now, and, now just, just for clarification's sake, in this case, you're talking about he, you're talking about his physical voice, his, his mouth voice, um, and in your no, case, you're talking about his sort of musical voice. Since you're, you're, you're yeah, you are, I know it's a, yeah. No, that's sorry, a, that's I just wanted to clarify for the rock stars. You're doing some compositions that are instrumental, but you're also doing some that are um, instrumental, and you've started singing on top of them as well, um, which is cool. Uh, but keep going up talking about your friend's voice, and then I've got a question for you about that. Yeah, and. Uh, I, that's a great distinction. When I use the word voice, I'm oftentimes using it from a more abstract mat rather than literally my physical voice. Like what is my artistic voice could be something that's purely instrumental. Cre not. Cristo, the, the sculptor, you know, the artist, yes. when, when he does an installation, it's often pretty clear that it's a Cristo, you know, uh, a lot, he was known for wrapping a lot of things. I guess that's that's an easy one to pick up on, but I think even when he's done other stuff, um, there was a similar connection between all these these different uh, projects. Um, but do you feel like the actual physical human voice gives us a little bit more of an advantage in trying to find our voice because we literally have a physical voice? Or do you think that um, singers and composers of lyric are also going to be faced with the same struggle of trying to find something that makes their writing unique? That's a great question. Definitely our voice as an instrument, even though you can maybe try to mimic other people, there is a natural uniqueness to our own physical voice that is going to help make your personal artistic voice a little bit more unique if you're using your physical voice as the main instrument. Yeah. That definitely gives you a heads up. It is a lot harder from an instrumental standpoint because oftentimes you're working with instruments that other people would have the same access to made even more uh, severe by now the fact that we have people are using laptops and 
software and plugins that simulate different things. So yeah. there becomes less and less of a differentiation between the actual physical instrument itself. Well, because, virtu yeah. virtual synths with presets, um, the more you stick exactly. to that, the more you're going to sound like, uh, the, the less unique your voice might sound. Now, that's not to say that there aren't people that do genius work using a preset voice, and maybe they're the first one out the door with it, and it still sounds like them. Um, but do you feel like, you know, putting in more time and effort to uh, create your own sounds that are not really any preset is a good way to get there? Or is, well, is that, that yes. not really it either? Yes, but that that feels a little bit secondary again from what I was saying about what is the musical element that you're curious about. Mm -hmm. And then the tools that you're using for that become the secondary element itself. But I think if you chase after a unique sound via the... Um, via the tools or by changing the presets or something like that, it's, it, you're, it's not going to really work in the same way. You might get there, but you might paint yourself into a corner to the out point where you, you, you don't, can't expand very much. And that was maybe what I was going to bring up before with regard to reverb, let's just say. Mm -hmm. Someone could have a, a particular approach to, they drench everything they do in lots of reverb and they consider that their, their quote, artistic voice is very lush sound. You might be able to, to change the presets, come up with a weird reverb and other things you do so that it's like it's always, or maybe you're just recording the sound in, of the reverb of your room and your room is unique, so it's going to always have that sound. But that is going to become limiting pretty quickly. If every song you do, you're still draping it in the same reverb so that it, quote, sounds like you, uh, you're going to you're going to become stale pretty quickly. And so that's where I feel like the more fundamental elements of like, if you're thinking about harmony or melody or repetition or rhythm and timbre, those elements or a combination of them, obviously you don't just pick one and be like, I'm only about, you know, repetition. That's it. No melody. Um, then it would become limiting too. But I think the combination and how you combine those ones is why we have, so much music and so much art that's happening is because there is a tremendous amount of range that you can get in that particular combination and finding your voice versus uh, like more surface type things, which is like using lots of reverb or, uh, you know, the way that you might use a particular synthesizer or something or, like or that. Or everything's distorted or just any, exactly. anything you can think of. It's almost like that can make it more stylistic. You're, in other words, if you did choose to do a track with lots of reverb or with lots of distortion, you're suggesting that if you have, if you, if you're in touch with your musical voice, that will shine through the reverb track or the distorted track, nonetheless. Right. The, the and at that point, then the distortion and the reverb become a di an aesthetic decision about that particular song, and that situation, not as your stick, which is you always got to stick this reverb on it. So it sounds like you, right. You know, that, that, that approach is going to, is going to maybe work temporarily. It might sound unique, but very quickly you're going to run out of range for that. And it starts to become almost cliche at a certain point because you're applying it on everything. Cause that's all, you know, is like, I'm in a, I distort everything. The, the, my vote, the drums, I always distort drums. That's my sound. Uh, that kind of approach yeah. is going to become really boring pretty quickly. You might make one good album like that, but like a whole body of work, a lifetime of work, no, it's not going to work. So now you've also started a wonderful school for composition and recording called the Forte School. Um, tell us about that. And, you know, are these some of the things that you like to teach to your students? And are there some, some uh, sort of takeaways for us, some simple you know, starter lessons that we can apply in the studio now as we're going to compose stuff and find our own our own voice uh, that you might teach your students, for example? That's a great question. It's probably more at a fundamental. Most of our students are between the age of five and 10. Okay, great. But, so you know, stage, we, we might be doing our be... coolest stuff at that age too, you know, who knows? Yes. Well, I think when we 
how we approach it with the students is the recording is the like sort of secret carrot that gets them to work really hard as they want to record their songs and make an album out of it. And they don't recognize that in order to record and add drums and the like that they, they have to practice with a metronome. They have to learn to play without stopping. These are fundamental musical lessons or, uh, you know, to becoming a better musician that most students don't want to learn. Wait a and minute. So that, that does sound a little similar to me recording in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it tricks them into having to, to be better performers to record something. Um, and so they just think it's like they want to record and it's really just challenging them to do the fundamental things that they want to do. Mm -hmm. After they record, we tend to give them a little bit more free reign because it's sort of like the, uh, you know, at least in the beginning to do whatever the hell they want, even if it sounds terrible because they want to like add a whole bunch of instruments and do this crazy drum beat or speed it up. And I think what's most important at that level is that they just learn to play and fundamentally learn that they can change something and make it their own versus the typical, at least in the classical side, particularly with piano or violin, that the traditional way of learning those instruments is that you pretty much just play what's written and you're supposed to kind of play it like the composer meant you to play it mm -hmm. versus to change it. Guitar and drums, uh, because it's steeped more in rock music or jazz or other things like that, where people are constantly changing and riffing on things and, and doing something different. Those instruments have a, a musical tradition that tends to be a lot more improvisational and free feeling anyways. So it's really more for, from a piano standpoint, that just getting them into the state where they can believe that they can change something and make music with drums and other stuff like that versus just playing old classical pieces, I think is fundamentally more important than teaching them about recording techniques like using compression or anything like that. We right. That's way too soon for that stuff, I'm sure. Uh, well, that's very cool. Um, you know, if maybe we should just jump forward also to some of the the uh, music that I've seen that you've created. In fact, there's recently um, a new video that you released called "When Will You Believe," and it was this. Uh, it just kind of caught my attention. You know, it's like you're just sitting in your studio and you start performing, and it's sort of loop based, but it's all a live performance, and then you sing over the top of it. And the whole thing just holds together. It feels very like a very intentional start to finish piece, which was great. And then I think you said that it also got the attention of Ableton, um, who sort of reshared it recently. And I wondered if you could talk to us about um, putting that piece together, um, if, if that was the right one, unless I'm mixing up which one that was. But uh, putting that together, and then you know, talk about how how that works. Well, to go back to Something I mentioned earlier, maybe where my classical background factors into the way that I make songs or want to make recordings, is that for a large part of my musical history, if I wrote a piece of music, people had to play those parts. And so consequently, if you were going to, what, who you, a piece you were going to write oftentimes was, was heavily influenced by who was going to play it or what instruments that you had available. Very rarely do you just have, you know, like an entire orchestra available for the song that you could write. Mm -hmm. If you're going to actually get your music played, <laughs> it might come down to your friends in college or people that you have to more specifically work with. And I think fundamentally that still factors into the way that I would love, I try to write music is if there's going to be a part that that part is going to be played more or less by a person. Now, I may play all those parts, but they have to be played by a person. And I think the temptation of using computers and modern kind of recording aspects is if you have unlimited tracks, you can create music that is essentially uh, would be unplayable by a group of people or not, or not enjoyable to play. If someone had to sit there for five minutes and only play one little part, that becomes extremely boring for them. So I try to scale things back to something that can be played. And so sometimes when I'm doing that, which makes it even harder when I'm doing all those parts myself, I have to be even more limiting about determining yeah. what I can play. 
And I think that the compositional challenge I feel in that is that when you are performing a piece of music, let's say it's a string quartet, you have four people that are playing four parts for an entire piece. If you do not come up with something that is nuanced and is changing for those particular people, it's going to become boring for them to play and they're going to not be very inspired or not particularly very interesting to listen to. And I, in the modern recording aspect, you can record a part and then loop it very easily. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's extremely possible just to create parts that you don't do anything to. And so when I was the particular piece that you were talking about, I was thinking of essentially four elements. I had an initial riff that I was creating that I was going to loop. Um, and I did go back in post-production and do some nuanced changes to that because I couldn't do everything at the same time. But I did have a knob that I would use to, to adjust the filter on it. So I created that loop. The second part was me playing a part with my right hand on the keyboard, which was a synth lead. And the other part was the drums and then my voice. And so between those different four parts that I could juggle those four pieces at once, I could have the create this loop, get that started, reach over when needed to twist that knob, play the drums with my hands, sing a part with my voice, and then reach over with my right hand and play a lead every once in a while when that was to come in there. Yeah. One man and band. Then, <laughs> yeah. And then I, my thought process and all those things is that I want, I'm if, because there's only four parts, I need to do something that, that has a sense of nuance and change to those individual parts. Even if I'm repeating kind of a, a, you know, a phrase or an idea, I need to do something different when, with the drums this time or something mm -hmm. different with the right hand. It's going to expand this last time that I play the solo. I'm going to go a little and, bit longer. And the you know, fil something. filter was good for that too. I thought the filter, the filter was a, a yeah. clever way to take a repeated thing and, and have it have a longer expression. Right, exactly. And those are the, that, how I'm playing with those simple elements is a fundamental, uh, again, back to my classical training, that's what composers would do. They would take these simple themes of not very many ideas. And again, not to bring it back to Project Runway, but I heard that over and over again on Project Runway too. Constantly when they were critique, critique people, they say, you have too many ideas going on here. You need to simplify this and narrow it down. And I started to also continue to ask myself that question. Do I have too many ideas going down here? What is the real, the kind of key melody line or rhythmical element or something that I'm going after? And how can I pare it down to that? And then do the minimal amount of changes and nuance in order for it to hold together. So it still has enough, it's still breathing and changing, but that it's very much simplified. So is, on Project Runway, are they, you know, given garbage bags and told to make a swimsuit and dinnerware and something else? Uh, so those are the, eat, and their, their voice has to come through each one of these different um, creations? It would be a different day and a different challenge. But yeah, they okay, might say, right. okay, you know, here's a bunch of garbage bags or not garbage bags, but you have to go in the dollar store and grab a bunch of stuff and make an outfit out of it. And the next day you might have to uh, make an outfit for a dog out uh, of something you could go to the store and do. But, you know, obviously a dog is a totally different right. challenge than a person. <laughs> well, I'm super intrigued by the idea too. And I can't help, you know, asking myself the question. It's like, what, what would be a you know, similar thing in making music? You know, um, I guess that's what you're describing is like, uh, what, you know, what's your list of things that you had to pick up and at the Dollar General store, when you made, when will you believe? Uh, yeah, good question. So, would that be the, that the me, different tools you've got in the studio? Uh, it, for me, yeah, uh, no, because I'm going to go more fundamental from that again. I'm going to be like, what are the musical elements that I'm playing with? Mm -hmm. And for me, a lot of that has to do with some kind of unusual harmony. And the first kind of uh, chord pattern was from another song I did. I actually just sampled, resampled some piano chords that I had done that are a little bit of a complex, I kind of change keys in between of them. So the harmonic structure is a bit loose and unsteady. And that is something that is significant to me. Uh, repetition, again, is really important. Kind of a ostinato pattern 
those are things that I generally like to work into my music for something in some instrument in some way. Those are the fundamental elements I'm always going to reach for. And then um, some uh, like essentially the blocking, I would also say too. like, I like clear, this is happening. Now this is happening. Now these two things are happening together. Now these other two things are happening together and they're the mm-hmm. same four pieces, but I'm just changing the combination of which pieces are combined together. And I would, I call that kind of blocking. It could be something else, but where each individual piece by itself has a little bit of a sense of life and plays out on its own. And I'm just changing how I layer those pieces together in a very more kind of deliberate and stark manner, maybe. That, that's my musical elements. And then with that in mind, then I just kind of go like, oh, well, what are the... F- I'm sitting down and I'm just kind of finding a cool rhythmical pattern or something else like that, or maybe finding a good lead sound. And then I start to work into how do these sounds work together and am I going to distort this or not? Or do I do, then I'm making all those kind of more nuanced choices like, well, how much reverb do I use or distortion and compression? And well, but those things are secondary to the more fundamental musical elements. It's interesting too, because if I think about going into the studio with a band that, you know, a collection of musicians, four musicians, for example, those are, it's almost like having four elements. And maybe if the musicians play well together and they really have a, a, you know, a voice of their own naturally, then no matter what song they choose to play, it will sound like them playing that song. Um, But in your case, you know, you're really having to figure out who your musicians are, each each of which is you, because you're going to play it back yourself before you even begin playing. Um, and I wonder uh, if you could also talk about this process of like arriving at what those four elements are and what the loops are. Um, I had even written this down as a, a, a question in preparation for this, but I guess it was just, you know, this is it. What's the process for composing a loop-based performance song you know, do you build up everything as a complete thing and then break it back down into these individual elements and sort of set everything up so that now these elements can be performed? Is that sort of the process for this? Or do you discover some of this in real time as you're doing it? Um, I think that's a great question. I think a lot of it at this point is pretty intuitive and maybe I don't spend a lot of time thinking of it because I played with these elements for so long and for so many times. Maybe I'll back up and talk about how I got to there for just a moment because I think it will help clarify this question. Sure. Um, I do have a background in art as well. And as you mentioned, and doing painting and drawing. And one of the things I think that I always found challenging with regard to music compared to with art is there's a lot of greater expectation for musicians to put out a lot of different sounds and songs and and if you listen to an album most of the time people want you know they want fast songs and slow songs and songs with a lot going on and some with not going on and and that that's a a big burden that people put on music to have lots of variation even within the same album and there are some people that buck against that i think Radiohead's Kid A album is one of the best examples, I think, where they really, it's kind of almost, it's like one big long song that like is changing a little bit, but they're the way that they approach it all is so similar on that whole album. And I think for artists, they can much more get away with like, they could do a whole show that was only, I mean, Monet did this. He would like paint the same goddamn like scene in the morning, in the evening, it's the same <laughs> front of the building. And he's like just capturing how the light changes on it. And people are like, wow, look at that. He's got, I mean, imagine if someone put out an album where it was like the same song 10 times, <laughs> you know, one a little slower, one with a little bit more instrumentation, people would slam that thing because they would think it was not, didn't, it was too much the same. But I'll, I'll that, now that you said that there's going to be somebody listening who's like, but what about, you know, Album uh-huh. X by by Y, they're they're sure, but it's not the norm. And <laughs> right, I think totally. what I brought from that art background was learning to 
make or work with elements with more minimal changes. Like again, Monet paints the same place, applying different art. And I think when I practice what I create and when I spend time improvising, which is about, you know, loosely, I would say about 30 minutes to an hour every day. Sometimes it's more, sometimes I don't get to it. But for the past several decades, it's kind of been my practice is that I improvise. And when I'm improvising, I'm playing with those elements. That's my sketch pad. That's my time to sit down on a user recorder and I just record the ideas. I think since I started recording the ideas maybe six or seven years ago, I have some 3,000 different like recordings that are, they could just be like a minute long of an idea and then I'll change the idea and try a different version of it. And that particular practice where I'm just kind of uh, riffing on, on juggling these pieces around, you know, where, for example, if I'm about, this ostinato rhythmical pattern. I might do it with the lead sound, or I might do it with this uh, chord part, or maybe the rhythmical track, maybe with the hi-hat, maybe something else, and I'll just kind of riff on trying these different ideas out. Hmm. And somewhere in the midst of that, it, it starts to make me very familiar with the way that I like to work with these materials. So if you just sat me down at this point and you just said, oh, here's like this instrument and this and this, I would just pick them up and immediately start playing with them like I'm used to playing with them. And it might be like, whoa, what, how did you, wait a second, how did you think that out? And I'm like, I'm not thinking at this point. I'm just so familiar with juggling. And that's maybe how I would even talk about it. It's just like maybe different colored balls or different elements that I'm juggling with. And now I'm sort of used to being like, I'm going to try these in my left hand or throwing this one higher or doing this type of thing. And I play with that so much that you could kind of toss me a new thing and I'll just put that in there and, and work with it in the same way. And I find that if I do that on a regular basis, then when I sit down, my voice, just my artistic voice just more naturally comes out without me having to really think about it because I just don't, um, I am so kind of practiced in that. Awesome. Well, I want to dig into that a little more deeply here in just a moment, but we'll take a break for just a minute. Um, Rockstars, a reminder that you'll find links to the stuff we're talking about in the show notes directly on your mobile device as you're listening to the podcast, just click through. I've included a YouTube playlist of some of Jonathan's work and links to his website. So you can go check out some of this, these great compositions and we'll see you in just a moment for the jam session. You've already invested in your studio speakers, headphones, and treatment of the room. And you're passionate about creating great music, but your mixes don't seem to translate to the rest of the world. The reason is that your speakers and headphones are not telling you the whole story. The frequency response of your studio has huge peaks and valleys all throughout the low end that are completely screwing up your perspective. You may be doing your best to hit the bullseye with your mix, but your room makes the target of a perfect mix impossible to find. Wouldn't it feel great if there was a simple tool that could fix all that for you and help you get your mixes right the first time? Introducing Sonarworks Reference 4, the affordable solution to correcting your speakers and headphones in your studio. Built for Windows and Mac, Sonarworks helps you position your speakers, correct your control room imperfections, and get a million dollar sound on a home studio budget. Get a 21 day free trial at sonarworks.com and start your journey toward the perfect mix. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC.
Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Jonathan Heidel, j- joining us from Portland, Oregon. And we're going to jump into continuing talking about composing music for film and TV and finding your own original voice in the music that you produce. Jonathan, are you ready to jam? Yes. Awesome, dude. So we were just talking about um, this track that I saw of yours, When Will You Believe? Um, and, you know, where you perform live using a bunch of loops in the studio. And so it's like, it sounds like programmed music, but I'm watching you perform this whole thing in real time. And I think that's super cool, but I'd really like you to break down that setup for us as best you can, as best you can remember. Um, What, you know, are you using Ableton Live as your DAW for that? Um, Talk about how many controllers you might have needed to do and you know, what sort of things did you have to hook up? Maybe if you can even break down a little bit of what the, as again, as best you remember, I don't want to put you on the spot, but a little bit of the composition of the elements of the song and then what you needed to set up to be able to play each one of those parts and have it, you know, and, and particularly for the parts to play without you having to hit a keyboard at that moment. Yeah, great question. So I... As I mentioned before, I'm generally always looking for to boil it down to a couple of key elements. And if you have to essentially perform all those elements yourself, that definitely limits how many balls or that you can have in the air, so to speak, if you're juggling. You just can't put that many different layers on there. As opposed to if you're recording something, you can create infinite layers. So right. If you have to perform it all, you really gotta boil it down and then because you're using so few elements, the composition's got to like, it's got to hold together a lot more than maybe if you're just jamming a bunch of stuff together, people might get distracted by all the stuff that's happening. And so for me, I'm again, I'm looking for the musical elements first, and they might be, I'm definitely interested in some sort of harmonic. I like repeating things. Um, but not repeating the same way. Something always has to change. And as I mentioned before, in my classical training, even if you're performing a piece of music and there's a repeat sign and you're going to play it again, my teachers were always like, you always play it different. You never play it the same. You either play it quieter, you play it a little bit more nuanced, you do something different that second time around. So, so, so does this I, mean there were no, nothing was looped? There was only one part that I looped in that whole song, and that was in the very beginning when I did a little uh, loop, but I still never kept it the same. I was going to change the filter on it, and it's a very small element to change, but it is it does involve I had to have something that was going to change with regard to it. How would you, how do you describe which part that was, and what's the first thing you hear in that song? The first thing you hear is what I the, the one and only element that's a loop. So I set that up with Ableton that I was going to record the way that I um, I created a drum rack, if you're familiar with, with mm-hmm. Ableton. And I took a couple different samples, sort of the MPC style, and played a couple of those, lo- those uh, sounds and created a loop from that. So I just... So are you, um, sorry, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I want to keep interjecting these questions so we don't skip over them, but are you listening in headphones? I don't remember seeing headphones on you or not, but were you listening to a click track in headphones or are you looking on the screen to see some sort of click track? Did you even use a click track or is the, or is it one of these sort of organic loops that once you're hearing that first loop, you can just kind of play along to it without hearing a click? Yeah, this time I didn't use headphones because I was lazy. And I do sometimes I'm just trying to like get stuff out the door and no I'm not worrying too much about it. I wasn't meant for it to be like listened to on Spotify or something like that. It was more of a like watch on YouTube and it's and less on the music production side of it that was important. Uh if I was being smarter about it, I should have used headphones because there's a little parts in there where you can hear the metronome poking through because it's coming through the microphone. Oh, interesting. What is happening? But um, it doesn't really matter, ultimately. I mean, it's kind of just watching like a crude recording of a performance. Uh, you get the essence of it when you watch in video. I think I'm going to re-release the song and do a better recorded version of it and clean some stuff up. 
Um, but in that particular setting, I did just kind of put the metronome on. I played the loop, and then the record the metronome was set to go off after I played the first you know little piece. Um, and so, or I left it really low enough that it wasn't going to leak through the headphone through the microphone too much. And once I got that loop going, then I brought in the next layer. Again, I like these kind of separation of layers, especially when you're playing yourself. You you do need to kind of move from one layer to the next. It's pretty hard to just have too much going on at the same time. Um, I've been working at it, but it is hard to sing, play drums in my left hand and play something in the right hand right, at the same time. Totally. I got to like two, two things at once is kind of the max of what I can do. I think and put a nuance in there. I, I've and, played banjo and sang harmony vocals at the same time. So I know what that feels like. Yeah. The two I can do, but the three playing a drum beat singing and then playing with my right hand, some, a lead, uh, something's got to give in that component. So I try to just do two elements at the same time. So that, that right there sort of limits what my compositional elements are going to be. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to have to just be two things that, it, that, that I'm going to be playing at the same time. Okay. So, so before you keep moving, um, when you talked about looping that first part, uh, explain to the rock stars who maybe aren't familiar with, with live yet, what does that mean? How do you, how do you loop something in live so that you played that part and now it just starts playing instantly for you? They have um, in Ableton that you can go between triggering clips and more of a traditional left to right linear recording system like Pro, Pro Tools. Mm-hmm. Ableton has both. So I'm simultaneously recording in a linear format like you might record any live band multi-track recording. I'm multi-track recording is what I'm doing. However, Ableton has the ability to be able to record some loops at the same time and it's recording the loops and it's recording the um those loops into the multi-track linear recording as well so i'm kind of like doing both of those things i'm singing i'm playing drums and i'm i'm playing with my the keyboard and all those elements are being multi-tracked uh from start to finish without any looping the only one loop that's going on is that first part that I played. Okay, and then does is it something where you have to hit a button to tell it to start your loop and hit a button to tell it to end it while you're playing at the same time? Or yeah. do you sort of pre-program Ableton to just simply start capturing a clip and and then just loop and play back that clip automatically? Uh, Ableton can do both of those things. In this particular example, I did not have any pre-recorded loops that I was triggering. Okay, but right. that right. could also be part of it. I have done that as well. Um, where I had some and, pre-recorded loops that I already just I just triggered. And now I know one of the tools you actually use as a controller is Ableton Push. Maybe you can tell the rock stars what that is and and why it's a cool thing to use. I like using the Ableton Push because it brings a it starts to turn Ableton into an instrument, and more than anything, there was a. a a period of time, I should back up and say, there was a period of time that I started doing a lot of like recording type stuff where I was either programming stuff in or playing one instrument at the time and doing a lot of manipulation within the DAW itself. There was a, a big leap in my process again when I went back to trying to play instruments versus to ch- play with the recording itself to make the recording sound nice. And some of that has to do with my own training. I was trained to play an instrument. I'm learning on the piano again, or then wrote music for actual people to play instruments live, to play as composition live. So a lot of that came down to trying to understand the nuances of what a performer would bring to it. One of the Mm -hmm. temptations of modern recording is that you can, you can do so much without actually having to play an instrument. Yeah, and, um, that, and that things sort of, once they're captured as a loop, they are perfectly reproduced over and endlessly as a loop exactly the same way, which can be, um, that can be intriguing, you know, as it's one of the things that actually draws us in about loops on the one hand, but at the same time, you know, there's a difference also between original old school loops of, of hip hop where people were actually 
playing break beats back and forth, or you had to, you know, loop from a couple of turntables and the loops never quite line up perfectly and even the sequence stuff. So it's always evolving a little bit versus, you know, the computerized stuff in the way it's been for a long time, where it's like, once it's in there, it's never changing till the end of time, unless you make it change. Exactly. And that's where I really appreciate that kind of background for myself in terms of training is that it, it, it really baked of that perspective to always be changing something always in, into wh- how I approach that. So I, I tend to try to play a few more things live than I would maybe necessarily need to, because when I'm playing it live, I'm obviously going to naturally play things a little bit different. You, it's pretty hard to just be a machine where you just play every hi-hat note, this exact same um, you you have you it naturally bring some human element to that mix. Ooh, I'm glad you brought so that I up. I to, wanted to ask you about your hi hat too, because it does sound like you're playing some hi hats with subdivisions in your songs, and I wondered if, uh, but I don't see your fingers moving that quickly. <laughs> so I wondered <laughs> if notice, there was some yeah. good, good tricks with delays or something that, that I you was doing to tell the some delay about. in there. Yeah, and some of that comes down to uh, the challenge of like playing drums while I'm trying to sing or do other things. And I'm not a drum player. I'm really a piano player. So I can do more things when I play piano. But when I'm coming down to playing drums, I do go back and and uh, or put a delay in there. So it kind of is creating more tracks. I, I do some post manipulation. There was one part in the beginning where I threw a hi-hat in there that I didn't play because I realized it sort of needed it. The syncopation wasn't clear enough. Um, you know, I take some artistic liberty to not be like I have to. Um, I'm trying to make some music, not necessarily just trying to only make a performance, but um, that has to be played absolutely 100% live. Um, but the essence of trying to do it live is also to to create. I think it's interesting to watch people don't get to watch people make music, mm-hmm. and um, some of that comes down to a fundamental element of like I don't want to spend a lot of time on video production. That's not what I'm into. I'm more interested in making music. And I think people are way more forgiving on YouTube, let's say, if you're actually watching someone make music, even if the video quality and the editing is pretty basic and kind of maybe even sucks. But if someone, if there's a good musical performance, that that captures attention. So when I try to make videos, if I'm going to do something on YouTube, I don't want to spend a lot of time on video production or creating like fancy music videos. Because I think people are very interested in watching people play music. And so that's what I'm trying to create. Well, I do have questions about that. And we can come back to that if you want. But um, if it's quick and easy, since you're not getting too deep into the video production, um, tell us about how you like to um, shoot these videos. I mean, you you sort of did a, came up with some sort of multi-camera thing where you could edit afterwards and cut from one shot to another to show your hands doing these things on the keyboards. I thought that was a, that was cool. It's a cool way to watch it. And maybe for the rock stars who out there who might want to create musical videos as well, um, what, what tips do you have from stuff you've learned about making videos so you can keep it real simple and not turn into a giant production headache? Yeah, great question. What I use is I use, there's... Um, a couple different things. First of all, I have two cameras that are set up, uh, one above me and one in front of me or wherever I place that, that, um, I use this, let me look here just so I get the name right. It's called, it's like a big fancy camera. No, these are like $150 cameras that just plug straight into my computer. And then there's a piece of software called, what is it? Sorry. That's all right. Are these web, webcams or are these actual cameras that you would go out and take um, shots of your kid playing soccer? They with? are, they're web cameras. Um, 4K ones. I'm not doing it in 4K, but the, the quality is good. Mm-hmm. It's not great for sure. Um, well, I, can, I don't know what. I, I use one called the Logitech C920, so I can drop that reference for the Rockstars too. If, um, if that's I do have a logic text are. one, so maybe that's that's one I'm I don't remember what it's called. And then for but. your video editing, um, is are you using something like OBS or do you use a Final Cut yes. Pro or something like I'm that? I'm using OBS initially. And what I did was I created a extra large video 
screen like output. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially two 1920 by eight, 1080 pixels. Mm -hmm. So I have a, both of them that are recording at the same time, one on the top and one on the bottom. So it's kind of just like a big rectangle. So the, the audio file has both the upper and the lower captured at the same time. So, so then when so I, the two cameras, the two camera angles are on the same file, right? Not two different files they are on the same file. And so all I do is just import that into final cut. And then I just duplicate it and resize it. So one of the, one of the ones is like in the main view and I can't see the other one. And then I take the second iteration of the same file and move it to the other one. And then I just cut between them. So it makes That's pretty, very cool. So it makes it really easy to and pretty fast to edit them that way because it's the same file that I'm just duplicating twice. So Rockstar's OBS is a free open source software that you can use for video streaming. It's, in fact, it's what I'm trying to get better at using here to do um, camera switching and things like that for live streaming and for creating videos myself. And then Final Cut is an investment, but I think you could probably do the same stuff you're talking about even in something like iMovie, which is also totally. free. Because it, because it has so few cuts and manipulations. I'm not doing any fancy editing. I don't do fades. I'm just like, I'm just doing straight up cutting. There is a little there. So this is opening to kimono a slight bit here or a lot, I guess, actually. What I usually do live recordings like this I'm recording just solid into my DAW. And if I try to do the whole take on the song, not every time do I have a great take on one particular section. I do them again. I do sometimes, I can't, I think I did once in this song where I probably did the, the whole thing like three or four times, the song straight through. Okay. Then I go back and I look at them all and I'm like, eh, this one was really great. So I'm going to use most of this take except for the one time when I sang this chorus kind of sucked right there where I did that. So I'm going to actually pull that whole chorus from the next section. What I don't do is I don't, I don't cut in like individual parts. I generally just do a whole section at once, like a whole verse, a whole chorus or whatever it would be a chorus. I just call it that, but I mean, it could be whatever section you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about the multicam editing is that I can hide the 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 transition so if you're doing um because if you try to do the whole thing in one particular take i used to do it that way and it just takes forever because you're gonna invariably make some mistake in there something and these songs are not things i practice i'm like practically making them up as i'm doing them yeah i, I made up the song in like 30 minutes and then i recorded it so i don't really have it very well learned or practiced and so I'm kind of like learning it as I'm playing it and changing things as I go. And then I just listen back and I composite them together a slight amount. I mean, like I said, it would probably just be like one half of this song and one half of this take and one half of this take. And I just jam them together. And the two multi-track ones is enough to disguise when that changeover happens, but it's going to be a huge headache. And then also be a, a big thing if I spend a lot of time trying to like piecemeal the two things together because if you're going to make it about a performance then you really want to see yourself playing that instrument again i think yeah, that's what totally. people find interesting so that means you got to find a take that not only sounded good but it looked kind of good too and that just yeah that is challenging to do both of those things and so i do do a little post-production editing just to kind of like find a chunk I just usually say a chunk because I'm not doing it on like a, you know, a piecemeal basis. Not anything like you might do if you're doing for vocals and you have someone sing, you know, a chorus 10 times and you take little tiny pieces as right, you go. These are, you these are a bit yourself, more sections and stuff like that. It's like a total section. Yeah. Like the whole chorus in this section is going to be good enough to go in or not go in. And I, yeah. the more you edit, the longer it takes, the less work you can kick out. So I'm trying to not do that very much. Well, um, I know one of the things that you mentioned being really important as well was sort of um, posting regularly social media and and that sort of thing. And also, how how has that helped your music production and your mixing? And what advice do you want to share to the rock stars about why creating video and content 
around your music might be a really good choice? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so to back up a couple of years ago, I was still creating music for film and TV. And I was feeling like I really wanted to move more into creating music direct to fans and so to speak, instead of just for film and to develop my artistic voice even more. But I didn't feel ready. It was like classic examples like, ah, I, I'm almost there and I don't know what that is. And I kept experimenting with it and I was still constantly recording myself and trying out these different ideas. And they were a lot of sketches. I had a gazillion sketches. I think I mentioned before, like about 3,000 at this point now, 3,500, I don't know, sketches of recordings, way more than I need. I don't need that many <laughs> to create an album. But you I don't even have enough creating... time to listen to your own sketches. No, I didn't. It took hours one time when I was trying to sort through some of them. Uh, so I was feeling like I wasn't ready. And I knew I needed to move out of that. I then drew upon my art background and I decided I was going to need to experiment, but my music stuff was too precious. I had, that's where my degree is in. And it was mostly, and I, I felt the most self-conscious about it, but I didn't feel that way about my art. And I created an Instagram account where I started posting my art regularly. Cause I just did, I didn't care. I didn't care what people thought of it uh, or if I was ready. And I practiced getting, I my, challenged myself that I was going to post something every day. And I found that in trying to do that, I had to be a lot less precious if you're going to post every day. Otherwise, you're going to drive yourself crazy. So I had to just get stuff out the door, put it on there. And about six months later, I looked back on the sequence of the things that I had created. And I noticed that where I got to was really different than where I would have even thought. And some of that came from just being less self-conscious about sharing the process or things in progress along the way. Mm -hmm. And I think art is a little bit more forgiving of that. People like looking at sketchbooks and other stuff like that. The music ones that there's way more uh, a feeling of like, it's got to sound really good or sound radio ready or album ready to go out and you obsess over hi hat tunings and <laughs> levels and all that kind of, kind of stuff. But like when you're doing art, you can just post a half finished drawing and people are like, cool. And so I realized after about doing six months of that, I had taught my, I brought it back to myself and I was like, you, it's the same thing. And I finally got it. And I was like, I, okay, I'm going to start, I'm going to create an Instagram account. And what I'm going to use it for is just to keep posting my music. And the reason I chose Instagram is because they cut it off at 60 seconds and you didn't even have to write a whole song. <laughs> 60 seconds is barely enough just to do a verse with a little switch into a chorus and you're out. And to it was it like gave me a chance to create a sketch and to finish something, to mix something. And it, I just used it. I my challenged myself is every other day I had to post a piece of music that that I played, you know, was recording. And that gave me a chance to finish something and to ship it out the door, even though it was it was still unfinished but it was finished enough to share it and to start getting feedback on that and to do that process. It's, it's funny and, because I've heard stories and I've had a guest on here who did a song a day um, for a year, 365 days. And then another guest who was composing, producing and mixing like full, you know, finished album content once a week. Um, and they both sound like grueling taxing schedules but I like that you gave yourself a break in between each day. It's like every other day, you know? <laughs> every other day, yeah. It's a little and then more the, reasonable. Uh, well, I had to also edit a video, too, for that. So it was sometimes like, you know, it was still a lot to do. But it, it was also the 60 seconds was a break, too, because then I didn't have to finish a song. You know, and sometimes finishing a song is like that, that last little bit is what takes you all the effort. And it yeah. was more about, for me, working on my sound and juggling these pieces and testing things out and pushing myself to just create a lot more content. And that also taught me a lot about that massively helped my production skills because again, I didn't have any background in using compressors or EQ or mastering anything. And when I would like create the music and then I would put it on, listen to it on my phone, it would, I'd be like, I can't even hear the bass drum. Like, I don't how do I make it so I can hear the bass drum? And then I'd have to go back and figure out how to do that. And 
how to mix things and start to get familiar with jumping through different platforms. And that kind of iteration of creating essentially in a year, or I think I did it for about two years, I kept on that schedule. That's 300 and some quote finished pieces that I had to put out on a platform and mix enough to share it and to listen to how it sounds and finish it up and get it out the door. And that that challenge really helped me tremendously. Now I've since in the last six months, and this is fairly new for me too, because I'm moving in this solo career to actually create longer pieces. And, and I have some stuff I'm working on right now that I'm finally going to release on Spotify. And, uh, you know, I'm finding the same temptation is coming back to be perfect. And, and I'm having to fortunately have this experience on Instagram to teach me to, rem- to remind myself all the time, like, just do it and kick it out, like move on to the next thing. Because it's really hard when you start being like, Oh, I'm going to put this on Spotify. It's got to be perfect. Right. And you know, it's interesting to, remembering, again. you know, you, you brought up the Ira Glass quote, and it's this idea, again, that our taste is usually f- many steps ahead of our ability to create something that um, is as good as where our taste w- wants it to be, which is a description of what you just said. It's that same thought that um, if you give yourself enough time your the taste part of your your thinking is going to look at what you're creating and going and just keep telling you, well, this has got to be perfect. This has got to be perfect. And I, Ira's quote suggests that it's it's only through creating a body of work that our ability to create begins to approach um, where our taste is. And you know, maybe just this this idea of doing things quickly and giving ourselves limited time so that we just produce more work even if it's only 60 seconds, actually gets us closer to creating a body of work more quickly that comes, you know, brings our ability to create close to our our level of taste. I don't know, that's just popping into my head as you talk about that. Totally, and maybe to find some way to get yourself on a schedule of kicking, finishing stuff. And I, for me, finishing in a way that you're putting it in a public forum is the only way to, to really actually finish something because otherwise, and then it feels finished because it's now kind of permanent on another source. And maybe SoundCloud doesn't count because you can swap out your tracks <laughs> <laughs> so then you don't get a chance to like really finish it. But if you put it on Instagram, people aren't going to like scroll back and look at it anyways. Again, that's why I chose that platform is it doesn't tend to have a very long shelf life or Facebook, mm-hmm. something where it's going to fall into the past pretty quickly. But something that you have to finish up and do it. And I think also the, the music industry and this time frame is, is different now. It, it, it used to be that you, could, you needed to create a more solid and produced album because you were going to maybe tour with that. And it's, it was, you weren't going to do another. It cost so much money. You weren't going to do another one for a couple of years. And so ultimately, there was a higher heightened sense of importance around that particular album. People have a much more voracious appetite for new music now. And I feel like from a purely strategic standpoint, if you follow the older model, which is to create a massively precious piece of art that you're not going to put out for very long, that only really works for like the artists that are so top of mind that people are going to be sitting around ravenously waiting for four or five years before the person puts out their next album. That is not the scenario that most people are facing. If you don't put out something in a, in a month, you know, in a year, they forgot completely, utterly, completely forgotten about you. And I feel like that attention span is even shorter than that. So quicker, faster iterations or ways to introduce people to boiling it down what is a fundamental element that people need to do to connect and it's not that much it doesn't need to sound that good and it doesn't need to um look at that good for people to connect with you as an artist you know or whatever yeah. you're creating and i think the idea of connection is important too in content creation now where what you create uh, i think people want to feel like they get to know how human you are for whatever your art is you know in this case writing songs and creating music and so the more you give people a chance to do that, the better. I mean, my podcast is the one example of something that I have that is 
continuously and reliably running now for years and putting out an episode every week. And, you know, as I said to you, I mean, I don't even edit now. It's like, uh, we'll edit out something if it's a total clam, but, um, but we let it just be a live conversation. And I think that part of what's appealing about that and rock stars, feel free to send me emails and tell me that I'm way off base on this if you want to. <laughs> but, um, you know, what's hopefully appealing about that is, is it just feels more like you get to know me and whoever the guest is more importantly and and it just feels like you're hanging out with friends. So I think that that applies to making music too. I think people want to know you as the artist. And who knows, maybe your fans will have a, a, a clear sense of what they think your voice is and be willing to share that back with you um, as you open up a, a way to communicate. Speaking of which, uh, Jonathan, have you found a good way to open up any sort of lines of communication with your fans yet? Or is that sort of a next stage for you? Um, you mean like where, how I'm hearing back from them? Yeah. Do you have a dialogue well, going with the people who enjoy your music? Well, definitely Facebook and Instagram are the primary ones for that. I think that on YouTube, I'm still sort of working on my new YouTube development and I don't get as much feedback from that. Um, but Facebook and Instagram, there's definitely a lot more feedback that's happening on those particular platforms. And it's a, I'm constantly reminded that you don't always know how things are going to have an impact on anybody else. And sometimes when I, especially when I was on that schedule of being more direct, like I had to post something every other day, sometimes I would just be like, Oh my God, this thing sucks. I hate this, but I'm out of time. So if I'm going to stay on schedule, I just got to put this out there and then people would love it. And I would, be so surprised by that. And sometimes I was thinking, oh, this one's gonna, this one's gonna hit and take off. And then it would be pretty flat. And I, and I, I learned <laughs> that maybe I wasn't the best judgment of how that was going to be perceived. And I, since I've been expanding in other platforms, I'm also shocked at the variation between platforms for whatever reason that that that's happening. Maybe something on Facebook gets shared a whole ton of times, and on Instagram, it just falls off and like. Hardly anybody notices it. And you start to realize that maybe there's a lot more randomness involved in the cycle and maybe not to take whatever feedback or the data that's going on is maybe a very strong perception of what was happening. And maybe a good example of that is the, the, what you mentioned, this one piece we were talking about. Uh, I had posted it like a month ago at this point now and I was scrolling through my stuff on Facebook and I happened to look down and I was like, what the hell? This post jumped from like, suddenly there was like 20,000 views on it and like over a hundred shares. And I, I, I didn't know what happened to the, to the piece. And I was trying to scroll through and figure out like, how in the world did peep someone find this and come to find out that Ableton had finally share, you know, shared it like three weeks after I posted it. So I was, I was on, like I had moved on. I was posting other stuff. Wasn't paying attention to that song anymore. And something happened with it. And which wasn't stronger than the initial first reaction. It yeah. was a little bit just, you know, lukewarm. I wouldn't say it wasn't hot. It was definitely like, Oh, cool. Thanks. And so I just kind of moved on to other things and didn't really think much more about it. So it was just a good reminder that for me, when I focus on the process um, and that I'm see myself as more like a creative archaeologist, like, a, you know, I'm just out there digging and I'm trying to like find bones and stuff and assemble them into things that that's really where I, I come. I always come back to. You're, I know and, we and, all know that you're trying to take bones and assemble them into fashion swimwear. So let's be <laughs> honest about this. Um, so did you say that you had posted that video on Facebook or Instagram? I did both. You did both. But it but, wasn't until several weeks later that it actually got more attention. And which which one did they uh, put attention to? The Facebook post or on the, the Instagram Facebook post? one? Yeah, the Instagram one just kind of fell off. And and, and how how did they even notice it? What's a, what's a tip to no the rock idea. stars? Was it, I mean, did you, for example, did you hashtag Ableton or something like that when you were doing it? Is there some... I don't, I don't think I even did that. I think it was uh, one of the things I'm, I have mixed feelings about, but Facebook 
because of well all the stuff and the controversy, what's going on with Facebook and how people feel about it. I think at a fundamental level, from an artist standpoint, one of the reasons that it, I am leaning into it is because people can share your work with others really easily. And that's how I think the Ableton mm-hmm. thing found out. Someone probably saw it and shared it. And then someone who does the social media for Ableton saw that and then picked it up and shared it on their site. That's how I'm guessing it happened. And you never really know if they're who's watching what someone else's, who's in someone else's friend group. So when they share it, what do they see? So that's reason number one, I'm leaning into Instagram, Facebook, sorry. Number two is that you can lean into your post with boosting them a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for a while I kind of resisted that because I was like, oh, you know, God, Facebook is being an ass because they're making people pay to play now. <laughs> And then I kind of thought about that. And, and what I, gen- this is my process generally, is I usually give each one of my posts about a dollar boost. And it's like I do maybe 12 a month or 12, 15 video bo- you know, post a month. So 12 bucks. I mean, who ever heard of a, like a marketing platform that you can spend $12 a month for and reach potentially thousands of people from? It's absurd. And when I think about it from that way, and if you are going to be an independent musician, and you're going to need to think of yourself like a record label. Record labels would never put out music without putting marketing dollars behind it. Sure. That would never happen. So why would I, as an independent musician, ever think that I should be able to just put out music and not put money, marketing dollars behind that? That is like, that's really makes bad business sense. And Facebook is one of the few platforms that allows you to do that inexpensively. And I'm just boosting it to my own followers. These are people who've already said that they're interested in hearing my music. So a dollar goes a hell of a long ways to like getting that out to those particular people. And you can lean into it more if people get into it. And I've done that a few times. I've just been like, okay, hey, people like this. I'll put another dollar on. Not a lot, just a dollar to get that going. And I think that that kind of, um, to be able to give yourself a, a platform, you can, and then if people watch a lot of it, you could turn that post into an external ad to get new followers. And now you already have this credibility of all these people that have watched it and liked it. And when someone sees a post like that, when there's like a thousand people that have liked your, your, the, it, 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 it adds a certain amount of, you didn't buy those likes. Mm-hmm. Those are real people that liked it with comments and a real response. And that sort of opportunity is unheard of in the history of music to be able to to have an average person be able to for a dollar or two to be able to find fans and throw your music out to them and instagram it's it just doesn't work the same the way even though it's the same company i don't get it youtube you can do it but it's a little bit more expensive and it also kind of doesn't work as well that way so that's kind of why i lean into facebook is because you can you can put a little bit of money behind it and you can accelerate your marketing in a way that is pretty authentic because you're leveraging your own fans to share your music, Mm -hmm. which is better than anything in the world to get your fans to do that. And all that cost me is like 12 to 15 bucks a month. Dratted Facebook. Coming to the rescue again when we wanted to dislike you right now. (laughs) Kills me. Well, cool, man. Well, thanks for, thanks for sharing all that. And that's very, that's very cool. I, um, I certainly use Facebook for this and, uh, for some other things and I've dabbled in boosting posts as well and stuff. And I know that for a lot of us, it can feel very overwhelming to kind of look at all the options. So it's nice to hear you just kind of break it down. It's nice to hear you even talk about starting with one and then feeling good about switching to another later on, you know? Um, But let's dig back into, you know, your studio setup. I, I sort of sent us on a tangent for a bit when we were talking about your setup for when will you believe? And so far you described that, you kind of start, you know, you're, you're playing through the speakers, you're hearing the click track on your mic. Um, you said you could have done it with headphones too, so there wasn't any click bleed, uh, but it didn't matter because you were going to mix it, you were going to perform it, but then still be able to bounce a mix later where you mute the click. Um, and then you start out by building kind of a loop that loops all the way through, and then I think everything else is performed live, what were some of the other elements that made up the song that you needed to set up as far as instruments and controllers and stuff? Um, 
in this particular setting, I also don't. The push is really great because it provides a physical interface for um, manipulating elements into the computer. And I hate using a mouse to do things. It doesn't yeah. feel like I'm playing an instrument. I sure do wish we had a Pro Tools push. That, that even comes off the tongue better. It's got alliteration <laughs> built in. Come on, Pro Tools. Yeah, some sort of inter. Well, they have you know you have those those mixing consoles or other stuff like true, that. True, true. That, that go in, but uh, yeah, it definitely provides an element of brings me back to an instrument, and I want to play an instrument. And, and it's built well too. The push is really solid. It feels heavy, and and like when you hit the pads on it, they don't sort of squish away under your finger, right? They're pretty good. I do not use it for drums anymore for whatever reason. The second generation push is a little too, it's too sensitive. And I keep the finger things are too small. It's really hard to like get in there without accidentally triggering and hitting other, just grazing your finger on another little pad. And then you hit another, you know, cowbell when you didn't want to, you know, and that's <laughs> more cowbell, that's not, man. That's not what you want to have happen. So I got an Akai MPD because the pads are nice, big, thick ones. And oh, the MPD 24? To 226. And um, that gives me some nice pads to play on that really changed a lot for me or helped me to improve my my finger drumming when I could actually just have some room for them and you could lean into a little bit more and just it feels like an instrument now. So now I, push I, and I was like I will jump in with that. I, I'm actually sitting right in front of me as the Akai MPD 24, which is an older model, I, I think. Or maybe yours is the larger keyboard as well version, but the um, the pads when I got it were a little bit funky and didn't didn't feel great. And then I found there was this site online. I can't remember what it was called. I'd have to find it again. But they sold little rubber squares, so I had to order oh, yeah, these. Yeah. And then you you take the MPD twenty four apart and you take off the rubber cover for all the pads, and then you insert these little spacers into each one and put it all back together. And it really has been great ever since that. So they also anyhow. sell aftermarket. Like you can, you can stick in inserts that would have the bigger, thicker rubber pads too. This, this newer version of the MPD 226 has just the better, higher quality pads. Well, I think start. that's awesome. You don't have to do aftermarket. This is for whoever you are, a rock star who's dealing with one of these has been frustrated. You'll probably be psyched to know if you didn't, that there are aftermarket things. Just dig around on the internet and you'll find some, you know, add-on for your controller that you didn't even know existed that you can customize it and tweak it. Yeah, and for me, again, that comes down to, like, I really want to... My fundamental beginnings are as a, as a musician. And so I'm trying to always get back to... If I'm using electronic stuff, I want to play things like an instrument and I want to have things that enable me to have nuance the acoustic piano i mean it's you don't you don't get to change sounds on it you have to play those nuances by how hard you hit it or what you use with the pedal and that's if if also i was encouraging people to improve what they're doing is to maybe really work on your musicianship skills like how do you get more nuance from that and so when i play drums live I'm trying to, I'm, I'm not a drummer, so I'm getting better at that particular thing, but I kind of try to think of it as like I'm playing keys on with my fingers, just like I was playing the piano, I'm just playing pads. But I want to learn to get the nuance on there. I want to like be able to change how loud and soft I'm, I'm hitting something or nuances with timing so I don't have to quantize everything. I don't quantize that much. I do a little bit of quantizing, maybe like 60% is what I usually quantize to so that I'm cleaning up a couple things and granted I make a few mistakes and I bump those over and 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 then use my multi-track editing to make sure that it's not too obvious that I'm doing that which you picked up on around the like hi-hats going a little faster than I was actually playing with my fingers <laughs> so sometimes sometimes I, I go in there and make some nuances like that but I want to try to play it no I totally picked myself. up on that that was one of my questions was um whether or not you uh, you know, had any suggestions for the rock stars about making sure that the drums you're using for trigger drums um, or for pads, you know, playing them back as samples have expression to them. Cause I noticed that on some of, on a, you had a couple other videos, Flying Lotus and Dream of Venus. And I think I noticed that in those videos that 
it was you playing with the other uh, another musician who was on keys and you were playing the drums and your drums totally like sounded expressive between the kick and the snare which i thought was really cool yeah that's a good and, and i do program that in there i if i you, know, you wanted me to get technical on that i do make sure there's velocity sensitivity and the other thing i do is i also do velocity sensing filter adjustments so when i hit it a little softer it pulls down the filter on and the louder i hit it the more that the filters opened up because that's kind of what an instrument does too if you hit it a little softer mm it's going to be a little bit more muffled or you could play it more muffled. I mean, right. You could like, you're playing the drums. They can, someone can, you know, way the way, the way they're using the sticks or what they do on that can make it more muffled. And then they can open it up by the way where they hit the drum. And those are all those kind of nuances that are really hard to replicate on an electronic setting because the tendency is for just to slap you right into almost no velocity and sensitivity. The, the samples just bam, right wherever it is right and i did the same thing on my when i created the initial loop on that song and i took some piano stuff that i played before and i cut it up i did the same thing i did it so that i would be able to if i hit it softer it would pull the filter down a little bit so that i'm never gonna again not gonna keep it the same because i'm never gonna be able to hit the exact same velocity over and over and over again there's always gonna be some nuance but if you don't have anything program to change by difference in velocity, then you're not going to get any of that natural nuance. You're going to have to go back and program in, in later. And I want to be able to, I also trained my body to be able to use velocity as a way of, of changing nuance. And so I'm trying to, to use my training, which is velocity sensitivity and playing a real instrument to be able to translate into the electronic realm as well so that I can kind of recapture some of that nuance that I'm kind of used to doing. And if someone hasn't had that training, I think you can get around it by going back and doing programming or you can kind of work on it yourself. And I think that that's something that, again, more and more, the, if you're wanting to differentiate yourself and find that to stand out, that learning to be a good musician is becoming more and more rare because fewer and fewer people are creating music not few and fewer, but that's the hard way. A lot of people can sit down a laptop and throw some stuff together. It's a lot harder if you play it. And if you can prove to your fans, you can play it and you can do stuff like that. You can stand out maybe a little bit more. Well, I'm also going to suggest that, you know, the world of laptops and DAWs, they don't always make it easy to have it play like a real instrument. No, um, they don't. For a number of reasons. One is they probably know that most people are playing it. And if it goes out at like full velocity, it's going to sound more powerful coming out of the speakers and people will be thrilled more quickly. Two is everybody's got a different controller. So you probably do need to customize it to your controller to actually get it to play right, just like tuning a guitar. Um, and three is it's it's kind of hard to uh, to understand that stuff at first Rockstar is basically, if, you, if you're not familiar with it yet, if you've got a, a pad controller that's controlling like some sort of drum machine sampler playback, um, you know, plug-in in your DAW, there's a like good likelihood that it has velocity control that's happening there. So if you hit the pad really hard, it's going to play loud. If you hit it really softly, it's going to play quiet. And there's also um, that same velocity curve that's what you're talking about Jonathan is that that there's you can change the curve you can change that sensitivity curve but it, it can also control the filter so that like Jonathan's saying when you when you hit it quietly it actually the filter like filters some of the high end out of the sound and makes it a little darker Jonathan when you're doing this are you doing this are, are you sometimes taking like a pre-purchased drum kit that um, just loads right in up into Ableton? I'm into the drum rack, or are you often taking like a kick and a snample, a kick and a, I'm blending my words together, a kick and a <laughs> snare sample, <laughs> a ksnample, and just like loading it directly in and then sort of like setting up how it, how it responds when you do this stuff? I do both. Um, I do both of them. I think that I'm probably a little bit less inclined I'm trying to kick out more music, so I, I think I'm feel fine using pre you know loaded drum things. I'll just do a few things to change that or change that nuance because I'm looking 
uh, you know, I don't mean to keep repeating myself. I'm trying to look at a more fundamental level of like the elements that I'm combining together and how I'm juggling those things rather than like, is, did I make this snare sample versus like, you know, um, just using a packaged one. Right. Totally. And I mean, because I'm the one that's playing it and I'm, again, that's an advantage of doing a video. If you're doing a video of yourself playing it is that people are watching you make the music and they're not really having to listen as clearly for like, is this the same, you know, 808 sample that I keep hearing on the other ones or the same <laughs> preset? It, I don't, I think I could have used even more generic presets and it still would have like had an impact um, because that I wasn't really focusing on the sound nuance as much. I would pay more attention to that nuance of the sounds if I meant to release it to from purely an audio standpoint. And maybe that is also something I would bring up too that factors into how I make decisions, which also came from Project Runway. I'll not to keep, you know, circling back go, around that. Go for it. But um, it also came from my upbringing. But when you wrote music, it was oftentimes for a very specific context. Either that context is the actual instruments and not only the instruments, but the people who were going to play that instrument. I knew if I was going to have a cello player, it was this particular person. And if I knew their sound or their range or a vocalist in their range, you, you know, if you're going to write a song for them, you kind of like need to consider the context of those people and where it's going to be performed. And I noticed the same thing that would come up in Project Runway. The most successful designers that they always had a really clear context for that outfit. And when they would say to that person, they'd stand up and hear they're presenting their outfit. This designer would say something like, they would be like, who's your girl? Tell me about this outfit. And they say, this is for a 22 year old uh, woman who's going to um, lives in the Upper East Side of New York and is going to an art gallery opening where she knows that her ex is going to be and she wants to make him jealous. Nice. <laughs> they would have that specific of a context with which they made this outfit. And I remember hearing that over and over and over again. And I don't do this as much as I should. So I'm, this is a reminder to myself. But I had to ask myself the same question. Do I have a clear context in mind for this music that I'm creating? And the challenge with creating recordings is that you could feel kind of like, well, it could be listened to anywhere, you know, on the phone or in the car or the whatever. But I think that there's something really powerful as an artist. When I say an artist, I use the big A, you know, artist. When you create something for a specific context, ironically, it actually translates better than if you just were trying to create something for everybody or for sort of every possible context. Right. Same thing with marketing too. You have to, the more specific you get, the better. And almost like having a persona. And I have started to be a lot more specific about that. And then I like to create an album even that is something like, you know, this is an album meant to be listened to driving across rural Idaho in a convertible uh, that someone's listening to on a way to a funeral, you know, like, what would that sound like? You know, could I, I think that's a great that idea and be really clear about the context that you want this to be heard in? Because when you're re creating recordings, the, the problem is, is you feel like it could be listened to everywhere in headphones and something else. And that can really water things down when people had to perform music. And that was the only way that you could listen to it. The context was everything. If you're performing in a large con concert hall, that context is very different than an intimate, like a living room setting or, a, you know, a little vocalist with a piano and a couple of friends that are listening to that song. That's an extremely different context or, uh, and film is all about context. That's a, you know, again, these are the backgrounds that I have. And so that's why it resonated with me. You are creating music for a very specific scene. And that is that context defines a lot about what would happen. And I, realized that one of the reasons I was struggling a lot in trying to create my music is I I didn't have a context in mind. And the hard part is yeah. in that situation is you have to create one for yourself oftentimes. You have to create your own context. And when I did the song, and this comes back to what you were asking, like why am I making decisions that I'm making? I'm creating my own context. This song is going to be performed on my desktop that I'm going to record with video so that people will watch it. That's the primary 
context for which I'm creating it. So I'm thinking about, I can't have that many things even out of the view of the camera that I'm changing. I got to p- arrange all these pieces. So <sighs> everything I'm doing has to be in the view of the screen. Uh, and what am I doing with my hands so that it, you know, I'm jumping up here, jumping over there. I'm thinking about, these are part of the context. When I'm writing the song, I'm literally thinking about like, what are the pieces that I'm going to play so that someone can watch me play those pieces and that they'll show up that way. That does factor into what I choose to, the music that I choose to write. Or again, yeah. you know, if I can have to do it all myself uh, and people are going to watch me do that, if they're, you know, no one wants to watch me just push a button and the track, and they could, but and I just sang, but like none we, of the we parts watch were seen. Super DJs do that at Bonnaroo a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's there. Okay, whatever. People still watch it, I guess. But like, I, I wanted to try something different where they had to actually watch what I played. And so then that becomes a compositional element that influences the choices I make. Similar to on Project Gwenway, when they're like this woman who's going to go to this art gallery opening where she's going to try to like catch the eye of her ex-boyfriend, you know, and then they're choosing the materials. They're like, well, this is going to define the context of, you know, if that That's very guy's cool. really into like shoulderless dresses, then I'm going to make that dress shoulderless because that's the context is to catch someone's eye in this particular setting and then it defines how they make the outfit. And those people, again, I watched them over and over again on that show. That's what made them successful. And then I had to ask the same question. I, is that true? Or what is true about that with regard for um, the, you know, creating music? And if that's an element, that's a fundamental element that I think transcends art, music, fashion, you know, whatever that would be that you're, wanting to create is being really aware of the context. I think that's great. I think that's a really good takeaway for this episode too, because I I mean, I'm trying to do more songwriting myself and I found myself often coming down to the studio and playing some stuff and I start hearing some words come together with music and then I get stuck because I don't, I'm like, well, I don't know what to, what words to say about what I'm like, what am I saying? And it's only the times where I sort of, let go of anything that has to do with thinking it has to be anything at all. And I just say, well, like what's important to me right now in this moment, what do I feel like saying? And I, and I just try and go with that, that I begin to actually complete a song and write something. But I also am thinking about, um, I got one more question for you before we kind of wrap up here. Um, I'm thinking about your studio setup too. And in your different videos, I saw some different configuration configurations and I wanted to know how how important is it to create one setup for your studio and leave it that way or do you reinvent your studio often is that part of the context for each composition as well yeah great question I'm trying to I think there's advantages to both I try to think a little bit about marketing in what I'm creating too so if I'm you know creating something that's going to be shared you know, I know that Ableton, I didn't expect them to share my music, but I know that people search for that and they find it via, via that way. Or maybe certain synthesizers that people are interested in. And then I'll be like, hey, look, I made this in music on this synthesizer. So they're finding, looking for that synthesizer. I think the same thing could be true about cover songs or whatever that's part of that process. And that's part of my compositional element as well. So mm-hmm. I do tend to try to you know, change some things around sometimes that uh, maybe might even involve a specific piece of gear um, that I'm hoping becomes searchable more on YouTube than other platforms. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that having, I have got, I do find it to be best from a studio standpoint if I, I have everything sort of plugged in the mixer on different channels and everything sort of ready to go so that I don't have to spend a lot of time like rearranging things because then that just takes away from, you know, kicking stuff out the door. Do you try and give yourself a separate rearrange day? Do you just let yourself go into your studio to just simply hook things up and not make any music at all? Oh, uh, that probably does end up happening, but I don't necessarily schedule that. I'm always, I'm not trying to do that as much because when I've gone to a different studio and I spend more time doing that, it's, I find it really frustrating. Yeah. So I'd rather just like, I already have a template set up for Ableton that's got every input in it that I need. And so when I pull up a new session, I just look through it. And I go, 
I delete the ones that I don't need versus the other way around. I have everything in it, like a whole glut of stuff. And then I open it up and I go, yeah, I'm delete 50% of this because I'm not going to record that stuff today. Those channels, I just, they're gone, but they're set up to be like, oh, this is the, what comes from the roads. I'm just not going to record it. Then I delete that channel, oh, yeah, but, that's, it's in, that's good but, idea. It's, but it's in my template so that I, I don't have to go back and like, you don't have to look for the plugin, make that synth, find that no, sound, all that well, stuff. Well, I've already kind of dialed that stuff in, and now I just uh, can work with it pretty easily. Very cool, man. Well, let's jump into a couple of just like the the closing jam session questions. Um, I wanted to ask you if you, I mean, I know we've talked about a lot of stuff, but was there any particular recording tip hack or secret sauce, uh, something that the rock stars could use today in their next session in the studio that you might want to share with them? Um, the biggest thing I would say if you're starting off is to not try to use fewer plugins and fewer tracks. It's Just so hard, right? It's so hard to do. It's so hard to not uh, get caught in layers because I would hear something and I'd be like, it doesn't sound good. So what I need to do is add more. <laughs> right. I need to double the track, add multiple EQs. And then I would find myself, I had so many EQs on things between that and the final one that I was like counteracting myself as I went and never was having a really clear idea. I'm like, God, I really need to crank up the trouble on this. And then I go find myself digging in later and realize like, oh, I really turned it down on this one track. So that's why it's up really high at the end. <laughs> Probably could have just been in the middle and been fine. <laughs> but I'm, you know, just dinking around too much with too much manipulation. And maybe the other thing that I felt like happened that really started to help me improve it is I found this uh, website called Sound Gym. And G it, G Y M Sound Gym. Yeah, Sound Gym. There's probably other ones that are like it, but it's basically like they just give you a bunch of exercises and tests that work on the fundamentals of recognizing compression and EQ. The EQ one is way hard. Didn't realize how bad I was at recognizing different EQ levels. Until you start to like isolate that and do a, you know, they play something and you have to like guess which one they boosted. And oh man, and that is tough. I soon realized how how horrid I was at these particular things. No wonder I was so bad at it. Uh, so th I started to work with that, and that really helped a lot because there's just nothing worse than having to go through and try to um, just know it sounds bad and not and experimenting with it. And honestly, then the other thing that really helped me a lot, and this is a little bit more of an investment, but I found that isotopes um, mastering and channel software that they have, they have this thing now that it uses AI to like listen to your track and provide a suggestion. Which is that Based Neutron? On, yes, Neutron. And then they're like Ozone one. And they boost and lower certain frequencies and put some dynamic EQ on stuff. And, and then it gave me a chance to kind of reverse engineer. I'd be like, Oh, why did they boost that particular level or whatever? And then go back in and be able to, so it kind of just gave a great way of like hearing something and giving me some visual feedback on it and sort of giving you initial suggestion. And I found that like working backwards from that, was so helpful than when I was learning or continuing to learn these things. I did that one yeah, about a totally. year ago and that really accelerated my growth a tremendous amount because it gave me, just gave me a little boost. So having a little, like some a of, little digital mix coach. <laughs> yeah. A little, that was probably not always doing everything accurate, but at least it gave me a like a rough cut that I could like, that showed me some things that I didn't realize that uh, were more, and more elemental than that, but that, you know, it's not cheap. And so that's a little bit more difficult to, to do. Yeah, no worries, man. Well, th those are great tips. So thank you for that. Um, let's just jump through these two really quickly. I mean, you just talked about okay. some software, but um, any particular hardware stuff in the studio that you're excited about, or you just want to tell the rock stars about in case they don't know it? Man, the other thing that really changed things for me was getting a mixer, uh, a real mixer. Just a physical mixer. mixer physical mixer. I got one that's got 16 channels. Uh, 
and got 16 direct outputs. And so I go into my DAW from that, from those direct outs, but I go into my mixer first. And just to be able to just bring me back into like analog audio, reach over, turn it up, and be able to like hear myself without any latency. Hate latency. Right. So your, your headphones plug me. into the mixer as opposed to plug listening the to the DAW. Yeah. And I know that certain, you know, interfaces and DAWs have that more direct mixing. But again, it just is like way more concrete when it's going through the the um the mixing console first. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And, and I have to say, I mean, I'm I'm fortunate to have a Pro Tools HDX system in here, which the latency is traditionally with a TDM system is always so low that I don't ever think about it. But um, but when I try to use external things um, that with you know native interfaces that inter- interact with a DAW that is set up that way, and it you know I try and use the the um, the mixer software in between to try and route things differently. It's such uh, it's such a mind fuck, man. <laughs> I just like it doesn't. Totally. It, it never goes as easy as I wished it would. So. I'm totally with you on that. If there's a simple, simple way to just hear yourself and not have to deal with it, that's always the best way. Absolutely. And I think it goes back to what I was saying before. I'm trying to get I'm trying to get a, out of the DOM more and more. I was I definitely dove into it the late 2000s, early uh, you know, in 2010, 2011 when it really started to get pretty good. Um, you could really make some good music on there, not that expensive a level. Mm-hmm. It was so tempting just to do so much of it in that stage. But I think that ultimately, and I got, I have to admit, I got kind of lazy from those years and quantizing things too much and making too much manipulation. And I've really backed out of that in the last three or four years to working on my musicianship skills, like playing stuff through, doing another take if I didn't play it good. So it would be right on and be able to play stuff through and to be able to make place play an instrument i think that's the biggest thing i would encourage people to do also you can turn your daw into an instrument you can turn electronica stuff into instruments but i think that that more and more when there's that's what people connect with because that's how music has been made for all of time it's made primarily with an instrument and you can turn your daw into an instrument whether that be a mixing you know old school mixing like that's what they used to do right they fingers on all the sliders and you were like bringing it up and down because you couldn't automate stuff you were having to play your mixer like it was an instrument when you're mixing final tracks down so that um that can be done from a production standpoint too and even though some of that is like uh hard but if anything i think that that there's a way there's going to be a new, a subtle nuance that people are going to pick up on, even if you're just a production person and you're going to work your, I mean, they always talk about in a performance, the sound man is another member of the band, right? They're unrecognized oftentimes, sadly, but the person <laughs> manning that mixer is, has a huge impact on how that happens. Hey, even when, if you're just when you say sound people. man, that, that sounds like you're talking about live shows. Come on, dude, the engineers in the studio Engineer, too. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all of that. Whoever's manning the 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 gear that's recording it the yeah. elements like that yeah and i've watched you Lidge, do that you know i remember when you do those live performances and you i think you know you doing so much like live mixing translated into how you engineer things and and do that because there's an element that that adds a human element into the mix of how it translates from the performance into the recording and that is um, if if you the more that I think as a production person as engineer if they're introducing themselves into that element, that's what gives that that can be an element of your own personal voice that goes into that your artistic voice because yeah, right. you're, you're 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 participating in the creation of that music, not just like you know set them up and the tracks just kind of roll in and then going in post production and kind of tweaking a bunch of automation going on. No, I love mixing it live if I can. It's it's always fun. It's what I do at Bonnaroo. It's what I do at the, um, or what I did at Stereo Sessions, which is what you're talking about. Rockstars, yes. if you're curious to see any of those videos that he's referring to, you can go to stereosessions.com. And those were live band performances here in the studio. We used to do shooting with iPhones and stuff. It was a lot of fun. Um, 
tell me, Jonathan, are there any other um, favorite software tools that you're excited about or plugins or just, you know, do you just want to give one more shout out to Ableton? Anything you want to let the rock stars know about? Well, I definitely love Ableton a lot. I think the reason that I like it and how I try to explain that to other people who are not familiar with it is that most recording DAWs are extremely linear in their approach. You record from front to back. And I think that, or side to side, <laughs> right. left to right, right. Uh, whatever, you got my, my gist. What I meant by that is that it works really well when a song is more complete and you have, you know, kind of walking into the recording process, kind of already how you're going to track it. And so that doesn't need to change. I mean, that's been working great for people for a long period of time. I think where I find, I tend to be making up my songs as I'm going, even after as I'm recording them, they're less like I wrote, sat down and wrote them separately as a song. And now I'm just going to track them in. And a linear recording really paints me in a corner off the times because I play this piano part and then I'm playing a bass part that goes along with it. And then I get this, by the time I get the drum part, I'm like, something isn't working, but I try to then go back and redo the bass track, but the bass track was the piano track. So after I change the piano track, the bass track doesn't fit anymore. And then I have to change the drum track. And I'm, I'm constantly just struggling with trying to like work around these different elements. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons I like to do things a little bit more live. So I'm doing two different things at the same time. So there's an element of play that's already built into the process of two parts responding to other another part at the same time. Yeah, that's, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. That was a question I kind of skipped over, which was I, noticing you playing two parts at once. And I was thinking about you having been trained as a classical pianist, where you're doing a left hand part and a right hand part. And by by playing two parts at once, do you feel like that just forces you to subconsciously make them fit together better? Oh, absolutely. It's no different than if you're multi-track, not even multi-track recording, but if you're tracking a song and every person who's playing an instrument plays separate, there, there's an element of, there's a certain, it's really hard to not make that stale. I should just say it that way. Because the person who played before, there's no live element of, of two people responding, two instruments responding to each other in that particular moment from even if it's subtle or unconscious how they're influencing each other so i feel like i can do that with myself if i'm doing like a vocal part or a piano part and a drum part but i, I it's like if i don't play two parts at the same time the my music always feels a little bit more stale so so i heard from a guitar player that i met out in la and i apologize because i'm not going to recall his name right now but he was telling me he I think he played on the the Beck Sea Changes session, um, which was produced by Nigel Godrich. And um, he was talking about one of the cool things that he saw Nigel doing as a producer was suggesting that every time or as often as possible when there was an overdub done, he, there would be two people playing at once as opposed to um, just one person doing an overdub. And I think that fits perfectly into what you just said, which is this idea that, you know, it's when it's man versus computer, uh, you know, man's human versus computer, a human's going to mostly just do what they feel like, you know, what makes them feel like a rock star up there on the guitar or the keyboard or the drums until they listen back later and they go, oops, you know, that was, I was stepping on toes. But when it's human playing with human, I think we're, I think whether we even hear it in the headphones or not, there's another form of like, you know, brainwave communication that goes on in the room and in the studio that helps us lock in together in a different way. So I know we can still yes. screw each other's parts up, but yes, <laughs> I, th I think there's still something to that. So I'm glad you mentioned there that. Is, yeah, the one thing I do use to get around that a little bit, in Ableton, it's more possible. I don't know if there's something that translates into Pro Tools or Logic, but there's an LFO plugin that's just, you know, straight up one that you can use in Ableton and you can turn that LFO onto whatever parameter you want to in, like, let's say, a, a plug-in. And you could do it on a filter. You could do it on a reverb or something. And you could use many LFOs as you want to to change something. 
I will oftentimes throw something in like that so that it, in essence, it's introducing some randomness to the process and or an, a loop that's not necessarily synced up. Sometimes I sync it up to the measure, but other times I'm just letting it fly because it, it's starting to change something. It's like the filter's going up and down and there's some jiggle that I, you can introduce into the LFO. So it's kind of like, you know, change, doing something <laughs> to like throw things off a little bit. And because yeah. that's not controlled, how that lands and lines up to, I'm listening to that and I'm responding to that live. You know, this it just happens to be sweeping a little bit more in this moment and I lean into it so that there's an element of like unpredictability that is involved in the tracking process mm. that I find that if I use something like that, either it's, it's changing what I'm doing or it's changing what else is there so that I can respond to something that's not fixed. And I think that's maybe even more what the human element is that can be replicated a little bit in software, not quite the same as another human, but it is an element of that unpredictability. Now, does Ableton Live also have the, the capability to capture that that LFO randomness um, that just happened so that next time if you think, wow, that was great, you can just press play and it'll it'll recreate all of what just happened for you along with what you just recorded? Good question. Yes and no. You, When it's generally rolling, it's just rolling and it's going to change every single time. If you set up another track so that it was recording the audio of what it was changing from that, then it would record it. So you'd have to, tra- you'd have to like route it to another channel. Okay. Yeah. All right. Multi-track recording in the DAW itself in order to capture exactly what happened there. I usually don't because I don't find that I care too much. I feel like just that little bit of randomness. I'm not making a change that drastically right, too. Right. It's just a little bit of randomness in there to keep you, it. You know what else it could be too? Loop. What, what else it could be is um, it might catch your ear just enough when you're doing an overdub that just keeps subconsciously reminding you to listen because you're listening for this new thing that's happening. You're listening. And right. I definitely find that we make better music in a recording session when everybody's really listening. Right. That's, that's a good point. Could well, be that too. Well, so um, Jonathan, we've been going for a real long time, which is awesome and talked about a lot of cool stuff. So thank you so much. Uh, one last question is hypothetical. And we're going to take the Wayback Studio machine, go back in time, find young Jonathan. I don't know whether you still got your cool spiky hair back then or if that's more of a more huh. recent thing. <laughs> but um, Or maybe you had like long shoulder length hair back then. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, you're going you're gonna to find yourself. Had a mullet walk at up, one point. Walk up boldly to yourself at the piano and say, young Jonathan, I've come back in time to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to become a rock star of the recording studio, what advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Um, I would definitely do more. Um, I would definitely do tell myself to not give up as much, not be discouraged. I think that would be great. Nice. I think that's good advice, man. We could all use that. Well, dude, thank you so much for being on the podcast with us. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you about all this stuff. Um, let the rock stars know how they can find you online. If they want to go follow you and your music, where should they go? Uh, probably the best. That's a good question. If you want to see active stuff, would be going to Facebook or Instagram and following me there because then you'll keep up on what's happening. My website is a little bit more static. Okay, and um, Groovy. Well, then we'll go there. We'll go to those places, although your website looks really nice too. So it, I think it's always great for the rock stars to see examples of uh, elegant looking websites for inspiration. Um, thank you again, rock stars. I want to remind you, you can find links to everything we're talking about in the show notes on your mobile device, or just go to rsrockstars.com and search for Jonathan Heidel, H-A-I-D-L-E. And um, we'll see you around the studio, dude. Hopefully we'll hang again soon. Sounds good. All right, dude. Cheers. Great talking to you. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. 
Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.